My name is Abby Shurik. Um, I am new to the Ely community, so a new Eliate. I was supposed to present actually in November, um, but that kind of got moved up a little bit. So I moved here in July um, for specifically my position at the hospital. Um, but I'll kind of talk a little bit about my career um, path and getting to here. But one of the biggest things was I wanted to work in a rural community because I wanted to be more than just the pharmacist at the hospital or the pharmacist in the clinic. I wanted to be a person of the community. So I'm very happy that I get to take this opportunity today. Does not want to move at all. There we go. So just a little outline for presentation today. So I'll talk a little bit about myself and then we'll talk a little bit about what a day in the life of a pharmacist looks like and a little bit of that behind the scenes that you might not necessarily see at the counter while you're in the hospital setting. Um, we'll talk about the road to becoming a pharmacist and then um, we'll talk slightly about EBCH and the services that are offered at the hospital here in town. And then kind of at the end, if you have questions, we can use that as an opportunity to um, have a little bit of a discussion. So um, just because I feel like I necessarily need to say this, um, financial disclosure, I am employed at the hospital, as we can see by what I'm also wearing today. Um, but what this is meant to be is educational for you guys, just to learn a little bit more about what a pharmacist does and just kind of the services that are offered here. So I'm hoping you take something valuable away from this. So a little bit about me um, credential wise. So um, I grew up in New Prague, Minnesota, so south of the Twin Cities, smaller town of about 7,000. Um, I went to South Dakota State University, both my undergraduate and pharmacy degree. So I got my bachelor's in pharmaceutical sciences in 2019, and then I got my doctor of pharmacy in 2021. Um, I went on to complete a postgraduate residency, which we will um, talk about later on in the presentation in um, with the University of Minnesota. I was in cent um, center care system in Painesville, Melrose and Sox Center. And then um, during that time, I also completed a teaching um, certificate. So I love doing education as hence why I'm here today. Um, and then um, currently now, so I finished that in June and then I came right up here in July and I started at the hospital. So um, we can just see there's my beautiful kind of pictures from my experiences. So the biggest parts of a pharmacist that I like to do with my career is you're really part of that healthcare team and you're specifically that medication expert. Um, so the nurses, the doctors, um, anybody who has a question on medications, normally it's the pharmacist in the background giving them those answers or kind of giving them that information. Um, where do pharmacists work? So obviously we know they work in the community side where you pick up your medications normally. They work in the hospital side. Um, some pharmacists work in the clinic. Does anybody else have any known of where pharmacists can work? Consulting. consulting. Yep, there's consultant pharmacists. That's a great um, career choice. I'm a very much discussion-based person, so I do like when people respond. But yes, so we talked about retail settings. So we think of our Target, Walmart, our um, Zups or Essentia um, pharmacy here in town, or our EDCH pharmacy. Um, we have, oh, that's not right, here we go. We have hospitals, like where I work currently. Um, pharmacists can work in the clinic are called ambulatory care pharmacists. Um, Long-term care nursing home type pharmacists are also those consultant pharmacists. And then um, pharmacists can work in pharmaceutical sales and development, um, as well as many other different types. So compounding pharmacy is one we'll discuss today. But we'll kind of start with the most common types of pharmacy that you see. So when we think of our community pharmacists, the people that we go and pick up our medications from, um, when the pharmacist gets that medication from the doctor, either the doctor can call in the prescription or becoming electronic nowadays, they get it on the computer. They check to make sure the doctor sent over the right medication and it's the right information. Um, they fill the medication and when they're filling that medication, they're checking, do, does the patient have any allergies to medications? The other medications that they're on, is there any interactions between them that need to be um, told to the patient while they're on this new medication? 
And this is all um, then counseled to the patient to make sure that the patient knows how they're gonna take medications correctly. I worked at a high B pharmacy when I was in college. So I worked there for just about four years. And there's many, many times where I feel like this is something that can be overlooked sometimes because it can be confusing getting a new prescription, not knowing how to take it. So really making sure that the pharmacist can take the time to explain how to take the medication or what to watch for. Um, and then moving more into the services that community pharmacists offer. Um, so talking with patients about their um, specific medications that they're on to making sure they're not having any side effects, making sure that if they're taking a blood pre pressure medication, they're not um, having dizziness because their blood pressure is too low, checking to see if they check their blood pressure at home. Those are all good questions that a pharmacist might ask you about. Making sure if you were on an antibiotic, did the infection go away or are you feeling better after finishing that antibiotic? Um, other services that specifically our pharmacies here in town do offer as well are um, giving immunizations. So you can get your flu shot, your COVID shot, your, if you're needing a different shot, pneumonia shot, you can get all those shots at the pharmacy instead of necessarily going to the clinic all the time for it. And then some pharmacies also offer what's called point of care testing. Um, our pharmacy here in town does not, um, but you can get blood pressure checks a lot of times at pharmacies. Um, sometimes you can get COVID checks at COVID tests at pharmacy and strep tests. So these are all things that it's kind of moving towards pharmacists being able to do more of those clinical screenings. A little bit of the behind the scenes. Um, so this is the Healy Community Pharmacy. This is the one that's attached to the clinic um, and the hospital. This pharmacy is actually owned by EDCH. So this is the hospital's pharmacy. It is not an Essentia pharmacy. The one in Zups that just opened that is an Essentia pharmacy. So there is always that confusion between the two different types of pharmacies and where did my doctor send the prescription? So this is the pharmacy that's connected with me and I work every fifth some Saturday. So if you wanna come see me, I'm working this Saturday. Um, I will be in that building filling prescriptions. Um, but the biggest behind the scenes, I feel like insurance is always a big issue with things. So insurance is based on the insurance that you have um, sometimes limits if you get brand or generic of a medication. Sometimes with the class of medications, there's multiple different types of the medication. So the insurance might limit it to one type of that medication um, or the quantity that you can get. Sometimes you can get 30, sometimes you can get 90. Sometimes that insurance will tell you what you can get or what you can't get. Um, Refills for medications. Um, the um, Sometimes when you have that refill request and you're out of the medication, um, it has to be sent back to the doctor. What I actually found out here is if you go to the clinic here in town, the doctor does not always get that refill request. It actually gets sent down to Duluth and the nurses are the ones that are looking at that refill request. So yeah, your doctor is just across the hall, but they're not the ones getting that refill request. It's nurses down in Duluth and they have the huge queue of all the Essentia patients that are needing refills on medications. So ideally, if you can wait, have two or three pills left and then you're like, oh, I need refills on this. If you can give them that heads up, um, a lot of times it makes it go smoother and not being running out of medication. And then another one of the um, kind of behind the scenes is prior authorizations um, or PAs. A lot of times if it's a specialty medication or something that isn't, the insurance won't normally pay for, but you need the medication, the doctor might have to fill out a prior authorization. And a lot of times the pharmacist is the one doing education on this because they're the ones that tried filling the prescription and then it's like, oh, the insurance won't pay for it. So they send a message to the doctor saying, we need to start a prior authorization. And then it's the doctor who has to fill out tons of paperwork. So when I was in center care, I was actually a clinic pharmacist. And so for all the patients that I saw, I fill out these prior authorizations. Sometimes they were like 13 pages of all the information, all the medications you've tried in the past, why they didn't work, why you need this specific medication. And so it's a lot of work um, filling those out. So it does sometimes take a while for the pharmacy to get the information to the doctor, for the doctor to get the information to the insurance company, and then for the insurance company to say, yes, we will allow this patient to have the medication. But the kicker of it all is 
the pharmacy that fills the medication doesn't usually get notified when the prior authorization is approved. So you might get a call from the insurance company or the nurse might get a call at the doctor's office, but we're never told about that. So when you come to the pharmacy saying, well, the prior authorization was approved, we don't know that unless we run the prescription. So that is another fun fact that if you've ever been in the situation where you come in and you're like, well, it was approved, we just, we were never told about that. So if you can call ahead of time or just have that patience, um, that's always a good thing when it comes to those sticky prior authorizations. And Ely Blumenson Community Hospital Pharmacy is celebrating 20 years. So they've been here for 20 years in the community um, this season. So September and October, um, October is when we're celebrating it. So we will be having um, some fun activities coming up this October. So stay tuned for that. So another frequently asked question that I get is, um, I'm on Medicare and my copays are really expensive for my medications. What can I do about this? So this is the perfect time to talk about it because Medicare open enrollment starts October 15th and it goes through December 7th. And during this time is when you can choose or pick a different plan if you have to choose a Medicare plan. Um, Medicare.gov has a lot of references to be able to help you figure out what plan might be best for you. So I just have a few pictures to kind of show you. Um, if you go to the Medicare.com um, or Medicare.gov and then you can do a plan comparison search. I don't know, has anybody ever done this before? Yeah. I do this for my grandparents, so I like to help them out with this. And so you have the ability to put in um, what kind of type of plan you're looking for. So your part D is your drug plan, so specifically your pharmacy medications. Um, when you um, put in your zip code, put in what plan you're looking for, um, you're actually able to add the specific medications that you take regularly. So you can add in and type in however many medications you take. And then you're able to compare the different types of plans. So the biggest things that um, are important to look at are um, obviously your monthly premium. So that's how much you spend per month. And then um, the deductible is another important thing. So it lays out exactly how much the medications would be and how much the deductible is for that plan. Um, you can also put in different types of pharmacies. So some people choose mail order because usually it's less expensive. Um, but you can also even put in, like, if you would want to do the Essentia Pharmacy at Zucks or the Ely Community Pharmacy at the hospital, um, you can make those decisions and you could see um, a good estimate of how much and compare those plans to see what's best for the medication that you take. So we'll move into um, what I currently do every day, um, my day in the life of a hospital pharmacist. So I'm going to start very generic and then get more specific about what I do here at EECH. Um, for the hospital pharmacist, it's very different depending on what kind of hospital you work at. So here we have a 21 bed hospital. It'd be a lot different if it was one of those 500, 600 bed hospitals in the cities. Um, for uh, all hospital pharmacists, you usually go on rounds in the morning. And so this means that the pharmacist goes and meets with the nurse, the doctor, the dietitian, whoever else is working with those patients. And we talk about how the patient is doing, um, how, um, if the patient will be going home, if we have to have switches of medications, um, anything like that. So then everybody's on the same page for giving care to the patient in the hospital. Um, most of my days I check medications, just like the pharmacist in the community setting checks the medication before you guys take it. I always check the medications before it's given to a patient in the hospital setting. Um, I also make the medications or I have a lovely technician that also helps me um, if necessary. So if it's like an IV medication that's given um, IV. And then I also meet with patients, and this is something that's done at most hospitals. Um, if anybody's been in the hospital, a lot of people come in to visit you on that first day of being there. Um, and so when patients are admitted to the hospital, a lot of times a pharmacist or somebody from the pharmacy staff will come in and talk about some medications. And our goal is really to make sure that the medication list on the computer matches what you take at home. So then we're giving you the same medications that you would take at home while you're in the hospital. Um, 
when you're leaving the hospital, um, if there's changes to medications, a lot of times the pharmacist will also come in just to make sure that um, you're aware of those changes that happen. So we're not confused the next day or a couple days later, um, and we don't have any issues with the medication side of things. So kind of the behind the scenes of the hospital pharmacy, this is um, not the hospital pharmacy here where I work currently, this was back in Painesville. Um, but we can see that middle picture um, is really what our hospital pharmacy looks like. We have all of the medications imaginable pretty much in our hospital pharmacy for um, patients as needed. On the left-hand side, um, when we make IV medications, um, it has to be in a very sterile environment. So we have um, a room that's considered our clean rooms. And so um, that is the clean room where either the pharmacist or our technician would go in and we have to wear a hairnet, we have to wear gloves, we have to wear a gown, we have to wear booties, we have to be all garbed up. And then we can go in and make those IV medications. And the goal of that is just making sure that no bacteria will get into your body um, straight into that vein. Um, but we usually have two separate rooms. Um, we have one specifically for the IV um, antibiotics or kind of those medications that you would get IV. And then we also have a hazardous hood. And so that's for specifically when we're making chemotherapies or other hazardous medications. And so that usually has more requirements with it. And then finally, the third picture over there, that's what an omni cell looks like. Um, these are what we fill every day to make sure that there's medications on the floor for the nurses. Um, so each one of those little tiny slots in um, the kind of cabinet that we have is a different medication. And so um, the nurses can literally go up to it, click on the patient, and it'll kind of blink for which cabinets are the medications that that patient needs to take at that time. And so it makes it a lot quicker for the um, nurse to get those medications instead of having to always run into the pharmacy to get them. So that is um, a newer system that has started in probably the last 10-ish years or so um, in the pharmacy, but um, they are very nice to have. And so here at EBCH, we have two of those omni cells. We have one in the ER and one on the floor um, with the patient's rooms. And then um, we are hoping to get one down in surgery too. So then the surgery nurses will have the medications in there as well. Here are just some pictures of what we, um, when I kind of mentioned those IVs. So you can see that, oh, we can see that this gal here, um, she has the hairnet, she has the um, gloves, she has the gown and everything on and she's making the IVs. Um, and so it kind of step-by-step -step process, you bring all the, in, the stuff you need in, the medication, the bag, the syringes, all of the stuff. You make it in that little hood there, it gets really hot if you're making a lot of them. Um, and then it gets hung for um, the patient at the bedside. So that's kind of just a little behind the scenes of what a pharmacist is doing um, when they're not running around the hospital. So how do the positions dif differ between small and big hospitals? Um, so specifically at EDCA here, um, we work two pharmacists. So there's me and then there's one other pharmacist in the hospital. Um, and we have to be prepared for everything. So infections, if a patient has an infection and needs to be put on antibiotics, we're the ones that a lot of times talk with the doctor about what's the right antibiotic for this patient. Um, we have an antimicrobial stewardship program, um, which is a nurse and lab and pharmacy all focused on really trying to prevent um, unnecessary antibiotic use. Emergency department for um, traumas and codes. So our pharmacists are BLS, so basic life cert, um, support and advanced cardiovascular life support, so ACLS certified. And so we respond in code situations. So if something were to happen to you or a loved one and it's a trauma or a code, we would be there helping out with the nurses, drawing up the medications and just being an extra support um, in those situations. Um, we are on call at the hospital. So our small hospital does not have a pharmacist there 24 seven, like a lot of the big hospitals do. Um, so if something happens between the hours of 4 p.m. when I leave and 7 a.m., we have a pharmacist that is on call um, that can come in if anything happens. So um, 
there's always a pharmacist available if needed. Um, and then just education for patients and healthcare staff. Um, specifically, chemotherapy is a thing that we also do at um, the hospital. And so if um, patients normally see their oncologist in Virginia or in Duluth, a lot of times they can still get infusions here. Um, we just have to work with that doctor at a different facility to um, prevent the patient from having to drive such a long way for all of those infusions. Um, and so that's something that we do. Um, we make sure that the labs are looking good so they can still get their chemo, that the dose is right. And if it is a new chemo, educating the patient on the potential effects of that chemo. Um, so I have a little activity for you all. So you can be a pharmacist too. So we have a patient in the hospital. His name is Mr. R and he's there for an infection. Right now he is on vancomycin, which is an antibiotic that treats broad spectrum. So that means it treats a lot of different types of bugs that could be in the body. Um, the nurse took Mr. R's blood. And a lot of times when we take the blood, we want to figure out exactly what kind of infection they have. So we can focus that antibiotic so they don't have to be getting a broad spectrum antibiotic. So the infection looks like that under the microscope. The lab said that's what the type of bacteria that's in Mr. R's body looks like. And so we need to choose which medication is best for the patient. And so we can see that this is the bacteria that he has, and he's currently on vancomycin. So it covers the pink and the purple and the green bacteria. So if we want to simplify it and use the antibiotic that will cover just the bacteria that he has, which antibiotic do we want to use? Wonderful, yes, cephalexin. That is, that is one of our oral antibiotics that a lot of people can get at a community pharmacy. So if we would want to send Mr. R home, we could easily start him on cephalexin and it would still kill the bacteria that's in his body. Um, I, I like to use this also for high school students when I do career um, type presentations. And then I like to have them try to pronounce the other antibiotics on the screen, but I won't put you through that if you don't want to. <laughs> So yes, yeah, cephalexin is the right choice. Good job. Compounding pharmacy. We'll go through this just briefly. Um, this is something that um, is not offered in Ely. A lot of times you have to go elsewhere. Um, specialty pharmacies will do the compounding type stuff, but this is making a medication that's not commercially available for a patient. And so really individualizing, personalizing the care. Um, I think of it as cooking with medications. We had to take a class on this um, and it was a lab. So we were really hands-on with doing this in pharmacy school. Um, and so this is pretty much changing that capsule or tablet into um, like a liquid, or if it's two different types of creams, making it into one cream um, or changing something if it's not made the way it's supposed to be, switching it to like a capsule for a patient. Um, and so, why you would need to do this if like a child can't swallow a pill yet, a lot of times that's made into a liquid for um, a kiddo. Um, if a patient has an allergy, so a lot of times like the dye that's used in the commercially available types of medications um, can be sensitive for patients. So if a patient has an allergy, they might need to be um, have a medication compounded for them. Um, or if the medication is in short supply, which does happen quite often in the pharmacy world, um, it might also need to be compounded um, by diluting it or doing something different with the medication to still get it to the patient. So this is just my compounding experience over the years. So a lot of times um, we had to use different flavorings to make it more appealing to a child. So um, using the medications that were available and just adding flavoring to kind of help kid a lot. Um, in this situation, it was um, a patient that it was like a fungal infection, but they also wanted it with um, like a steroid cream. So we just mixed the fungal infection or the fungal powder with the steroid cream, and it was just one thing at the end. And it's kind of like Play-Doh in a way when you're mixing it all together. It's, it's my version of creativity. <laughs> and 
one of my favorite was just in class, we decided to make chapstick one day. So I have a bunch of chapstick laying around from when I made it back in pharmacy school. So kind of some fun things for compounding um, for sure. But I don't think I could do it as a full-time job. It, it takes a really long time and I don't have the patience for One of my other favorite things um, in regards to pharmacy, I guess just in general, is there's such a variety when it comes to pharmacy, but ambulatory care is what I did my residency in. And so this is really sitting down um, with a patient and being able to be in the clinic setting, have your patients just like a doctor does, um, and talk to them about their medications. And so during my year um, of doing my ambulatory care residency, um, I did medication therapy management sessions. And so this, um, this happens also at community pharmacy settings. This is something that we're hoping to expand on um, in the hospital and in our community pharmacy. But where patients can sit down with the pharmacist, we go through each medication and just kind of talk about the potential side effects, what the medication's used for, making sure that it's working effectively for what it's used for, and then coming up with solutions if we do need to change something with your doctor. Um, diabetes education is another thing that I did a lot of. I love diabetes. I could talk for hours on diabetes. Um, but making sure that if a patient is just diagnosed with diabetes, being able to understand what diabetes really is, what the medications they're being put on is used for, what does your A1C or blood sugar actually mean? Um, so just being able to be that education and then um, being able to set up future appointments to make sure that we're meeting goals, we're answering questions um, and just living the best life that we can. Um, another thing is cardiac rehab. So um, when a patient has a heart attack or has something with the heart, they're put on a lot of different types of medications. Um, and being able to make sure that that education is there with the medication portion of things. Um, so I like to try to um, make myself a resource, especially for our cardiac rehab department here at the hospital, um, that if there are questions regarding medications, they know that they can always reach out to me. So those are kind of the big ambulatory care services that we are slowly working to implement um, at EDCH. So um, I do have um, a couple more slides of different things, but I just wanted to offer it up because that's a nice kind of close of the chapter of different types of pharmacists. Um, if anybody has any questions at this time. Yes. Uh, two questions. How many employees are, do you have in your pharmacy? And secondly, are you geared up now to take in walk-ins for uh, flu shots? Absolutely. So the first answer, so um, for our community pharmacy, we have two pharmacists and one technician for our um for the, that's the hospital pharmacy. Did I say hospital? For the community pharmacy, we have two pharmacists and then we have four technicians um, that rotate different shifts, but those are our employees. Um, we are geared up that if you would want to get flu shots um, for walk-ins, yes, that is something that we can do. Um, we also have more events coming up that I do have on a future slide, so, but yes. Yes. About off label uses of pharmaceuticals and so when we go through pharmacy school, we learn about how the medication works. A lot of times, each medication really has multiple different off label uses for it. Um, if I would come across it in the community pharmacy where it's a new medication for a patient. Um, the biggest thing is asking the patient what they're taking it for and then also being able to explain this is used for other types of things as well, just so you're aware of it. Um, it is something that's used quite often because the labeling process takes a really long time through um, studies and being able to get approved through the FDA. So it is used quite regularly and it doesn't worry me unless it's something that in the way that the medication works in the body to me does not make sense. And in that situation, I would probably call the doctor on it, but um, just making sure that the patient is fully aware that if it is used off label, it, it can still work and it can still make sense. Um, it's just not always number one useful that medication, if that answers your question. Well, you had showed like the picture of like the apothecary where all the meds are mm -hmm. and you talked about making medications 
talk about making medications? Are you just talking about compounding or are there, I guess, does that, does that storehouse really have everything you would need or are you truly making new stuff? So it has the basis of what we all need. Um, so for example, if it's one of those things that it's a medication that we don't have the right dose of, then we might split the tablet or we might make it into a solution so then we are able to take the right amount so the patient's getting the right amount of the medication. Um, a lot of times we have the IV medications, which is in a bottle, but it needs to be put into a bag. Um, so we would be putting it into that bag. Um, I've had other situations where um, we do have to sometimes order medications in, um, but for the most part, the medication is at least the basis of what we have. How do you manage like expiration dates? It just seems so complicated. Yeah, we have a lovely technician that does an amazing job making sure that nothing expires. A lot of times um, expiration dates for medications go out quite a long time. So it could be a few years um, if it's in a specific like vial um, or it's like an open tablet, it's good for a year after it's opened. So we usually put stickers on it and then we just take a look at it every single time and we just make sure that nothing expires on us. But we do that every month. We take a look at all the medications, make sure nothing's expiring in the upcoming month. Yes. What is your, did you have a question? What is your opinion on generic versus sometimes they are close to the Secondly, you go out to like a Mail or you see them being sourced by out of country pharmacy that are saying that it's going to be. I'm just curious to know your opinion on the generic versus the regular and then just go out and buy. Absolutely. So I think for so brand versus generic if something is ab equivalent is what it's called brand versus generic it is essentially the same active ingredients and so it essentially should work the same in most situations because the brand doesn't exist of lisinopril anymore nobody would ever get the brand of lisinopril for blood pressure it's always just the generic name after nine years they can start making generics of a medication. Otherwise it has to be brand. Um, I would say the one medication that I have noticed a little bit more is um, like thyroid supplements. So levothyroxine is a thyroid supplement. Some people specifically need the Synthroid and that can be because it's a hormone um, and that can kind of change. And some people feel that one works better than the other, which I'm not to say how you're feeling by any means. Um, when it comes to other medications, they'll have biosimilars is what it's called, where it's essentially you would consider it a brain versus generic, but it is still a slightly different type of medication. Um, and that is a whole other ball game more in the IV side of medication. Um, in regards to mail order or where manufacturers are coming from with medications, I would not be a good person to ask about that, um, just because I, I can honestly say I don't know a whole lot about the manufacturing side of things. That's more of those pharmaceutical sales people. Um, but I would say, especially if it's coming from one of our pharmacies, we have brand or we have generic. Sometimes we have to order in brand if we don't have it and a person needs it. Um, but for us, we, we get it from the same wholesaler that a lot of other pharmacies get medications from. Um, where they actually come from before the wholesaler. Sometimes they might be overseas. I guess I don't know exactly where they're manufactured, but they are held to a certain standard where the medication is supposed to be made in a very specific way. Yes. Yeah. So um, with the Paxlovid, there's actually no requirement of how long you have to wait with it being an antiviral. You can get the booster as soon after. A lot of people say um, wait about two to three months after you recover from COVID, just because you do have that natural immunity from when you had COVID. Um, so wait until that dwindles a little bit before getting your booster to get the biggest effect. 
given this is just very independent researchers giving these recommendations. As of right now, the CDC says get it whenever you are able to and just make sure you're feeling well when you get it. Yes. You might have just answered this. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> uh, I've had my two uh, vaccines and two boosters. Mm -hmm. And it's been a while now. So is that the, they're recommending now a booster every year? Is that booster available now or what's so what, what's going on with that? Yes. So the newest booster that came out is bivalent. And so that means that it covers both the variants that were previously covered in boosters plus the Omicron variant. It is recommended for everyone, um, whether or not you got um, one booster or two boosters um, after your original um, two dose series or one dose if you got Janssen. And so everybody should be getting or is recommended to get this new bivalent booster. Um, it is um, available now at pharmacies and we are also doing shop clinics for it. Um, the biggest requirement with that is it has to be at least two months after your last vaccination or last COVID booster. Yep, so we are doing certain um, COVID shot clinics, which will be both in the newspaper and on our social media page. Um, we will be doing one here at the gel tentatively in October, um, as well as if you would prefer to come into the pharmacy and get it, we do have it available at the pharmacy. Can you get the flu shot and the COVID shot same day, same time? Correct, yes. If they, they do. Nope, they don't interact. You can get them both, and it's actually recommended by the CDC to both, to get them both and at the same time. Yes. Um, I believe it's called Novax, and it's the third uh, So I'm wondering, is it's the Novax? It's by Pfizer, correct? Is Pfizer the one? Oh, it's totally okay. dependent on what you are It uh, got approved uh, a few months ago. Okay. And tested in different areas, including outside of the United States. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, it's designed differently. I don't understand all that okay. and how you formulated it. It's different from what it was engineered if you want to okay. fight the vaccine. I will have to look into that um, because I, I am not up to date on that to, to be able to tell you the information. I can most definitely look into it and let you know. Um, the only one that I know about is that um, bivalent, which is that one that's available currently, but we'll chat after. And so I will continue on just with the rest of the presentation and then we can do some more questions after a while. Um, so road to being a pharmacist education wise. So obviously graduating high school is a requirement for college. You usually have to have an undergraduate degree. So either um, two or four years of undergraduate school. And during that you apply for um, pharmacy programs um, for South Dakota state and North Dakota state specifically, you can do your two years of undergraduate classes and then your four years in the pharmacy program. And like me, you saw that I got my bachelor's degree two years before my pharmacy degree. And so that was specifically a focused bachelor's in pharmaceutical sciences. But most pharmacists, every pharmacist that you will see now has that bachelor's degree plus um, their PharmD degree. During pharmacy school, it's four years in total. It's three years of didactic or classroom training. And then you do one year of your clinicals or rotation. And during those... Um, anywhere between four to six week rotations, um, you go and see all of these different other areas of pharmacy. So you can kind of get a taste for different areas of pharmacy. Um, so I did like a pediatric rotation in a NICU. Um, I did uh, my ambulatory care rotations. I did a specialty pharmacy rotation. So you just kind of get to see the different areas. Um, then you receive your PharmD degree. Um, and so during this, you have a hooding ceremony, just like what a doctor would have. Um, and it's just that is your commemoration of being able to be called doctor. Um, licensure, um, so even though you have the degree doesn't mean you actually get to practice as a pharmacist yet. Um, for pharmacy, um, it's a little different compared to nursing. 
Um, you take your NAPLEX, um, which is your board's exam. So it's all of the information that you need to know to be a pharmacist. Um, but then you also have to take a state law exam for whatever state you want to get licensed in because um, each state has different rules um, with medications and being able to prescribe medications. Um, so you have to take each specific state law exam to be able to work in that specific state. Um, and then some people will go on to do the postgraduate residencies. There's both one and two years of it, um, or you can start a career as a pharmacist. So specifically with um, postgraduate residencies, it's to get specialized in a specific area of healthcare. Um, so if you think of your doctor being specialized in pediatrics or oncology or cancer or emergency medicine, pharmacists have the same abilities to you. So um, specifically when you do get into your PGY-2, so your second year of um, specialization is when you can choose um, oncology, ambulatory care, psychiatry, critical care, informatic. Some people are informatic focused and that's a lot of data that I don't necessarily understand, but it's very much necessary that um, extra information that pharmacists will look at to um, make sure that the medications are working correctly and more of those bigger health systems. Um, and then also academia, so being able to teach. Um, and you still get paid, but you're learning along the way. So it's just that extra specialization that a person can do. So for mine specifically, I did ambulatory care, and then it was in a specific rural health setting. So I like to say I have an emphasis in rural health. Um, but really, it's just what you're interested in, and you can have that extra information to bring along to these future jobs. Oh, and I had all the pictures that I told you to have about. <laughs> Our clicker's fun. Finally, for EDCH, um, if you aren't familiar with our hospital in town, it's a 21-bed critical access hospital. What the critical access hospital designation actually means um, is it's through um, specifically the Centers of Medicare and Medicaid Services, um, and it means that the pharmacist has, or the hospital has to be not-for-profit um, and rural. So there's a lot of requirements for it to be a critical access hospital, and that's what we are because obviously we're pretty rural out here. Um, and then we do offer many services to the community. So um, I do have a sheet up here that offers all of the services that you are free to come and grab, um, but just a few services that specifically I am involved in. Um, so um, our community pharmacy is offered, um, is open Monday through Friday, eight to six, and then Saturdays from nine to one, and you're able to get all of your prescriptions filled there um, if necessary. Emergency care, so 24 seven, um, if you need something, it's an emergency room, and I will be called in if it's urgent and you need something. Um, we do those infusion therapies or chemotherapies here. Um, so that is a service that we are expanding here um, to be able to provide to our residents. So then um, you don't have to travel as far, which is a great service. Um, and then obviously, um, if you were ever in the hospital, I might come and visit you because that's my job. And then finally, um, for influenza vaccines, this is a community service event that EDCH offers every year. It is free to the community. Um, scheduled dates that we have. Um, so for influenza vaccines, we will be giving them on um, Saturday at the Jake Forsman Memorial from um, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. and we'll be about across from the library or somewhere in that general area. Um, Tuesday and Thursday, um, October 11th and 13th, we will be at the conferences at the school. Um, I know it's still open to the public if you would want to come um, to get your vaccines at those. And then also Thursday the 13th, we will be here at the Grand Daily Lodge tentatively in the morning giving those flu shots. Um, and then for any of out-of-towners, um, we will be in Babbitt on Thursday, October 27th in the morning from um, 9 to noon. High-dose influenza vaccines are available for patients um, 65 plus. The biggest thing with that is um, we need to have your Medicare card, so bring your Medicare card when you come to get that vaccine because we will be taking a picture of it. But um, the copay, um, it does just get built through the insurance still. And what, what's the difference with the high? Yep, so the high dose flu shot, um, so both of them are quadrivalent um, flu shots. So that means it covers two um, influenza A and two influenza B strains. 
the um, high dose flu shot just has an extra dose of ooh, the A, I think it's influenza A, um, but it has that extra boost um, that's recommended for those that um, are of older age just because you're at higher risk. Other than that, I will open it up for questions. Yes. So uh, we couldn't really learn a lot about you, since we're lucky to have you. So where did this interest get born in you, and how did you find out about this job, and how do you uh, think about eating now? Absolutely. So um, when I was finishing my residency, I knew I needed another job at the end of it. I knew I loved I mean, I mean when you were a kid or whatever, when did oh. you get interest in eating? Well, I, sh I should have added that picture. My fourth grade science fair project was um, what antacid works the best. And so when I was learning about the different types of antacids, um, like the milk of magnesia, Tums, all of that good stuff, um, my mom made me go talk to a pharmacist and interview them at Target to um, figure out which one they thought worked the best. And so after that, my fifth grade science fair project was on sunscreen. So I also talked to them about sunscreen. And after those kind of just talking to a pharmacist, I knew I always loved like science and they were able to talk to me and explain things to me. And I'm like, oh, I just really liked that. And so that interest just came with me all throughout middle school and high school. And I went down to the Mayo Clinic to learn about residencies when I was a sophomore in high school. So I learned about getting specialized in different areas of pharmacy. And I just thought it was absolutely amazing. So I'm glad I liked it when I stepped foot in my first pharmacy after my first year of pharmacy school, um, because I never worked in a pharmacy before then. But yes, so I just, I knew I always loved the education piece and being able to talk to people and help them feel better. So it's that canned healthcare question of we all want to make people feel better. Um, but I think the prevention and being able to do that education is one of the biggest things that I love about pharmacy. But yes, when I finished my residency, I knew I wanted to do rural health. So I applied to all rural sites and I had never been up to Ely before my interview. Um, being Minnesota born and raised, I can't believe I never made it up here um, because I love the outdoors, but we had a cabin, so that's where I was every single weekend. Um, but I fell in love with the community and I stayed here and everybody was so friendly when I did kind of just a morning walking around town and I loved all the hospital staff. And so here I am. I absolutely love it. I could never do anything different, I don't think. So hopefully I'll be here for a very long, long time is my goal. But We'll see. My 90-day review is next week. So, call it that. But I think they seem to like me, so that's a good thing. Yeah, sure. <laughs> no, I appreciate that. <laughs> but yes, so I'm hoping to, with my education and my connections with the University of Minnesota and South Dakota State, I'm hoping to have more students come up here um, to be able to experience Ely and our hospital setting for um, an educational perspective. So that's my goal is being able to try to get more students up here and interested in rural health. Yes. Abby, you mentioned that you have a particular interest in, in diabetes. Yes. Do you have any sense for a, a new drug called Jardians? Yes. <laughs> I, Jardians is one of my favorite drugs. Um, it is a very, very good medication. I, it is, the thing that I like about the new diabetes medications, which they're expensive, and I know that can be an issue, and I like to try to work through that with my patients, um, Jardians is good because it protects the heart and protects the kidneys, which can both be issues with diabetes when you move further. Um, it might not be as good for lowering blood sugars or lowering A1C. Um, it does do well over time with doing that, um, but I like the additional benefits that a person can have with the medication. It can also lower blood pressure just a little bit because it is a slight diuretic. Um, so I personally like that medication, but it also depends on other risk factors um, that a patient has, whether or not that medication is right for them or not. Okay. Yes. Whoever. <laughs> it can be very, very difficult because there are great things about medications, but the 
drug manufacturers that have the most money are the ones that can do the advertisements and that's how they start to become more popular in that regards. So I like it to a point because it gets patients interested in their medications and talking about medications, but I don't like it in regards to, well, because I saw this one on TV, I want this one. Because a lot of times there's a lot of the little mumbling that they talk about or those little words on the screen that nobody can actually read that actually tells you things that is important for that patient. Tell me, um, so you said you love being outdoors. You chose an occupation where you're mostly cooped up in little rooms. What do you, what do you like to do outdoors in the winter? Yeah. Are you, are you all crazy here? <laughs> yes. So I have um, started picking up snowshoeing. So I do enjoy snowshoeing and I'm excited to try some trails up here. I tried cross-country skiing for the first time last year and I really enjoyed it. So I'm hoping to get some cross-country skis. My technician actually is involved in the ice sculpting in the winter. And so um, I'm excited to see her do the ice sculpting. So I think there's a lot of fun opportunities. I, I've never been dog sledding, so I'm excited to try that. So I can keep myself busy, that's for sure. But our pharmacy is a pharmacy that has windows. Hospital pharmacies are historically in the basement. And so normally you don't get windows. This one used to be. Yes, it used to be in the basement, but now it's on the second floor. And so we get windows. So I get the beautiful view of the backside of the hospital. So sometimes you get to see dogs walking by and kind of just some things. So we do get to see the outdoors, which is still nice. <laughs> Um, with uh, things being electronically shared on the internet, do you, um, do patients come in, um, can you see where they've gotten drugs, you know, from other pharmacies? I've thought about that, the people get into opioid addiction, so where they'll go to different pharmacies. How does that, is that working now? Is that it's shared getting, information? It's getting better. So we have um, the PDMP is what it's called. Um, and so specifically in Minnesota, um, and each state has their own PDMP where it says when um, specifically controlled medications like the opioids are filled. Um, so we are able to see um, where they were filled for that patient at other locations. Um, what it can be difficult, especially if you are like a, on the border of some states, a lot of times states with states don't share each other. Um, but it's starting to get more collaborative where um, states are sharing information with others. In regards to other medications, um, sometimes you can see where um, other medications were filled. A lot of times the insurance, if they won't fill the medication because it's too early, um, we are told that it was filled at a different pharmacy. Um, but there are ways to kind of work around and find that information. Um, but it could be easier, but it's not impossible. Find much, you intervene much and tell doctors that if this person is getting too many of these and they're interacting and for specific like regular medications, there there has been times that um, especially of patients, a lot of times people don't realize that they're having side effects from medications until they say something and it's like, oh well, that could be a side effect from a medication. So a lot of times that's where I intervene is oh, we know you're having dizziness. It could be from low blood pressure. It could be because you're on three blood pressure medication. And so, um, especially in the hospital setting, I have very open communication with the doctors at the hospital. So being able to talk openly about patients' medications is easy in that regards. Sometimes from the community perspective, if you don't have good relationships with the doctors, but here in Ely, there's not that many doctors, so you have to have good relationships with them. So I feel like all of our pharmacists here have the comfortability to call up a doctor and tell them, hey, question on this, are we sure we want this? There's a few different interactions that I want to mention with you, just so you're aware. So, yes. <laughs> Do you think or do you see a lot of the pharmacy techs that are usually young kids uh, go on to be pharmacists? Most of the drugstores have the pharmacy techs. I know they have to go to a little bit of school, mm -hmm. schooling. Yeah, so all of our pharmacy techs have a certification to become pharmacy technicians. A lot of times they enjoy the job, but they also see the pharmacist's job and don't necessarily want to do all of that. 
we do have some technicians, especially those that are in high school, that they're like, well, I'm a pharmacy tech because I want to be in pharmacy school. So sometimes there's that desire. Sometimes there's just that I like this career opportunity and this is what I enjoy doing. But a lot of times I feel like our technicians are not appreciated enough right. because I could not do my job if I did not have my technicians. So that is something that I very much make clear to everyone that the pharmacy would not run without our technicians. The pharmacist can can do a lot of stuff, but a lot of those logistics of ordering the medications and making sure everything is in and having those relationships with the patients, the techs do it better a lot of the time. Yes. I've always gone to the hospital pharmacy and uh, I, I can't go to the woman's hospital. So telling me the mm -hmm. Do you have with the one at Zups? Yes. Um, my first weekend of working here, because I was the only pharmacist on on Saturdays, um, I had a question and I called over to Zups. So we do have a great relationship with the Essentia pharmacists over there. The two gentlemen are absolutely amazing. Um, and it's just a lot of those things that if maybe our pharmacy is out of a medication and they have it, they would be able to fill it. So just being able to have that relationship between the two of us, obviously, I, I want your business, but I'm going to say they are, they're very nice and educated people and they would be able to treat a patient very, very well as well. Yes. Oh, now we're getting deep. <laughs> Um, I would never be a good political candidate at all because I'm not, my face does not like. Um, that is a really great question that I honestly do not know about as much. Um, we would still be able to get you your medications. I guess I don't know what the how the money or the billing would be in those kinds of situations, but. Our goal is to always get you the medications, and I honestly don't know how that would impact pharmacy in that regards. If you guys have any questions, you can you see me around town. There's my email. I feel like a lot of you guys know me already, so yeah. I'm, I'm an open book. I'm here to be able to provide you resources from the hospital setting. If any of you have questions about the services at the hospital, we have the handouts here. Um, I have Jody Martin's card, um, who is um, a big person at the hospital that can get you to the right people. Um, we have other little goodies up here. So if you want to come by and grab something, you're more than welcome to. But thank you. <laughs>